Hey guys, it's MJ, the student actuary, and in this audio talk, we're going to be discussing share capital and, you know, what exactly it is. So this is for subject CT2, and it's chapter 4. So in chapter 4, there's two types of capital that we're really delving into, share capital and loan capital. So the next video will be on loan capital. This one is on share capital. And share capital, uh, the basics of it kind of gets formed when, I think it was very first issued um, in the mainstream society back in the Dutch East India Company um, venture. What they said was, we need a lot of money in order to buy some ships, to sail around to India and make all these various trades. We'll make a deal with the public or with what they call investors, and they said that if you give us money uh, to buy the ships and do, do the whole venture, we will give you a share of the profits. So that's where the word share comes in. Because let's say they come back with 100 million and you would provided 50% of the capital, then you're going to get 50% of that profit. However, when you deciding to go into as a shareholder, you're also taking on all the risk. So if you spend 100 million on buying these new ships, they sail to India, but they get struck by lightning, or there's a storm, or pirates come, or I don't know, some sort of disaster strikes, which we term risk, the ship gets lost and your money is, well, it disappears, it sinks. So shareholders need to be incentivized in order to take on this risk. So the idea is that this is a lot of risk. We're prepared to, to pay the money, but we are expecting a very high return. As society has developed and technology has taken on a greater role in our lives, we've come to standardize um, shares, and we've got something known as stock markets or, or exchanges, where people come and they trade share certificates. So they say, I want to buy 20 shares at this company at this price. And in return, it gives me a specific percentage of that company. And what that does is I get then um, a profit share, and we call that profit share dividends. Now, it gets a little bit interesting in the sense that these shareholders come, they invest their money into the company, but they don't run the company. Instead, there is a management team. They do all the decisions. They decide you know, where the ship should sail, what, what prices they should try and barter, um, and you know, what route to go, and when they should do. They, they make all these decisions. They're kind of like the captain of the ship. If the shareholders are unhappy with the decisions that they're making, they can get together and cast a vote. And they can therefore say, we're going to vote this management team out and we're going to put in a different management team. And in real life, we see this happening quite a lot with an investor called Carl Icahn. So Carl Icahn is he's someone that a lot of companies fear because he goes in and he doesn't just buy a couple of shares that gives him 0.0001% of the company. No, he's coming in with a lot of money. He's taking over a significant percentage, and he's getting quite actively involved in the management by casting votes, having his opinion. And some companies that he's been engaged with, um, you may have heard of them, uh, Motorola and Apple. He's put a lot of pressure on Tim Cook to say, hey, you need to start paying dividends, you need to start paying out some of the, the cash reserves that Apple has to its investors. And because he owns such a large chunk and he is quite a intimidating character. He's able to rally the other shareholders, convince them that this is a good idea, and he is able to put pressure on the captains of the ship, in this case, Tim Cook. Um, I guess there's a joke there, Captain Cook. Anyway, uh, let's, let's get back to the material. So what we see is that by buying into shares, I get a dividend or a share of the profit, and I have the ability to vote for the management team. 
However, there is a lot of risk in the sense that if the company tanks, we'll see that the loan capital gets paid first before the residual then gets distributed amongst the investors of share capital. There is another type of, of share capital, which is a little bit of a hybrid between loan capital and share capital, and that is something known as a preference share. A preference share kind of works on the on the basis that I'm going to give you money and if you make a profit I want 10% of it or whatever percentage it is. If you don't make that profit well then I still want that money but I'll only take it when you do make profit the following year so it can get backdated and the idea of the preference share is that there's a little bit less risk in the sense that if the company has the profit, they pay out the preference share. Whereas if you had a normal share, it's up to the managers to decide, well, should we pay a dividend? And this dividend can be 3%, it could be 12%, it could be whatever percent. Whereas with the preference share, it is decided beforehand that they want 10%. And what is nice is that they will get their, their preference shares paid out before dividend or ordinary share capital is paid out. Some preference shares contain the option um, in order to convert them into normal ordinary share. So the idea being that I like this company, I'm not really sure if I want to become a shareholder, let me buy some preference shares. Um, it's almost like let's go on a date before we get married, see if the relationship works out before we commit. So that is your preference share. And like I said, it is a little bit of a hybrid between share capital and loan capital. But that's what I wanted to discuss in this video is uh, share capital. And I just want to end it off by discussing three key elements um, when it comes to, to finance. And that is risk, return, and marketability. Now, with share capital, we see that there is quite a high chance of risk in the sense that you might not get your money back. And because of this risk, there's going to be a higher return. And what we're going to see is that if I present to you two companies, company one is you're buying into a shoe factory, they've got a whole large um, order on their books, so they just need to you know, get the money, buy the leather, get the workers, and they're going to push out these shares. I mean, push out these shoes, which they're going to sell for a nice profit, and they'll give you a chunk. This is a company that has a much lower risk then say a company that says to you how we want to develop um, a complete new form of artificial intelligence that will be able to calculate various things and replace the need for accountants in the company workplace. This is a high risk venture in the sense that you're going to be investing millions into their, their R&D and at the end of the year they might have failed and they might have nothing to show for it. But because there's such a high risk involved, they will offer you a much higher return in the sense that if you create an artificial intelligence that can reduce the need for accountants, you're going to make a lot more money than if you had invested in a shoe company that had almost a guaranteed income stream of a couple of hundred thousand rands, whereas the artificial intelligence would be bringing in millions. But it's a much higher risk. But then we come to this third one, which I want to talk about, and that is marketability. And this one, what marketability means is how easy is it to sell this asset on the market? You know, how, how many buyers are there? How many sellers are there? The more buyers, the more sellers, the more marketable the asset is, which is a good thing because it means you can then liquidate your position and exchange that asset for cash, which you can then use for emergency situations. So marketability is a good thing. But what we're gonna see is the more marketable something is, the less return um, investors are prepared to get for it. Marketability and risk are also kind of linked in the sense that the higher the risk, the less marketable the asset. Although that is not always the case. As you will see with some derivatives in chapter five, they can have high marketability and they can have a lot of risk. 
But those are the three, three components and I want you to keep them in the back of your mind because in the next video we are going to be talking about loan capital. But yeah, that's all we've got time for now. So thanks so much for, for listening. Cheers.